Welcome back to another episode of Day Zero Lessons. Today, I'm really excited to be joined by Henry Ward, who is the co-founder of Carter. For those of you who have raised capital before, um, you most likely use some form of cap table management platform, and that's exactly what Carter is all about. So Henry, great to have you here. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for, for having me. Super excited to be here. Awesome. So cap table management, I mean, take us back to 2012 when you guys first started. What was going on in cap table management? Because I guess people were just issuing certificates. It wasn't really a thing, right? Take us back to the early days of what was happening in the space. Yeah. So uh, at the time, um, cap tables were managed by by uh, law firms. Uh, it was all managed in spreadsheets uh, in Excel, uh, and you know you would email you know your, your lawyer and you know ask for the cap table, and a week later they'd you know they'd update it and they'd send it to you uh, uh, you know manually, kind of kind of put together. And the other problem uh, or the other thing that was also happening at the time, which seems so antiquated now, is uh, you would get to prove your ownership, you would get a stock certificate in the mail, like a literally like the same kind you would get, with, you know, when you used to invest in the railroads in the 1800s, you know, it was like embroidered on the side and you have your name and everything. And they would FedEx uh, that stock cert certificate to you. And a lot of people think of us as a cap table company, but the the actual innovation, we weren't the first cap table software company. There, there were uh, three at the time when we started. Um, the The real innovation or what we kind of unlocked was not doing the cap table, um, but was actually replacing that paper stock certificate with electronic stock certificate. So the first version of eShares at the time, we now changed our name to Carta, but at eShares was not cap table management, but our competition was FedEx. Uh, it was, hey, don't, don't uh, send a paper stock certificate, email electronic one. Uh, we, were, we were PayPal, but for equity. Uh, and that's, that was our pitch. We just, you know, send, send the stock certificate via a token, a secure token via email. Um, and then if we could get the customer, the, the company to issue all their securities through us via the token, um, then we could actually construct the cap table bottoms up because they would be issuing all the shares and stock certificates and option grants through us. And then that would that would generate the cap table, and then we, the cap table was just a report that we would build on all the all the issuances, and and that was the that was the 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 idea uh, that created eShares. Why did you want to go down this crazy route of, of founding your own company? What was kind of that magical moment when you spotted that that opportunity? You know, I I was. Uh... I, I did it backwards from the conventional wisdom. Uh, so the conventional wisdom is, um, you know, you you have this burning desire to solve a problem. Like you just really want to solve uh, a problem. You've been thinking about this problem and you can't sleep at night because you want to solve this problem. And you, you've discovered a novel solution to this problem. And and then you go, okay, well, the only way you can solve the problem is to start a company. I was a little bit the inverse. I started a different company. Um, uh, that was like a robo advisor it was like a wealth front or a betterment. It, it died. It didn't go anywhere. Um, uh, but, but that experience of being a failed founder, um, even as horrible as it was to, to fail, uh, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Like I just, I fell in love with the idea of being a founder. Um, I loved it. And so I ended up after sort of closing the company down and going through kind of the trough of depression and coming out, figuring out what to do next. I knew I wanted to do another company. I just didn't know what I, what the idea was. And so as a founder without an idea, uh, and I ended up, you know, work talking to one of the investors I worked with, worked with, uh, on the last company who suggested this stock certificate cap table problem. Um, and, and it wasn't that I wasn't interested. I, uh, the first pass of it, I actually kind of turned it down. I, I said, it's not that interesting to me. Um, but as I thought about it more and we talked about it more, what got me excited about it was not the cap table or the stock certificate problem, but was that if you could digitize these, these paper stock certificates and turn them, turn private securities into electronic, uh, securities, you know, electronic shares, then we could build a stock market on it. And that got me, that captured my imagination and that got me really excited. Uh, and then that's what, um, uh, that was a catalyst to start to start the company. But I, I was very much uh, uh, a, a founder looking for an idea, not, not uh, I had an idea and then decided to be a founder. 
Wow. And this is back in 2012, right? So the startup ecosystem, I mean, is exploding, but it's probably not as big as it is, uh, as it is today. Um, I almost think of Carter as almost going to the hairdressers, right? It's all similar platforms to, to Carter. How did you build that trust? Because back then, there wasn't really that many platforms around. So how, how did you convince founders to use you? It, it was really hard uh, because, and, and it sounds crazy now, but back then it, it wasn't even just trust us with your cap table uh, uh, software, which was a really hard pitch uh, because they were like, that's really important. You know, um, my lawyer tells me not to use you. The, the lawyer says we should, we, you know, I, we should keep it with the lawyer. Uh, uh, it was also just hard to get startups to trust software in general. It sounds crazy now, but back then startups didn't buy software. That was a very weird thing for startups to do, uh, was to buy software. Um, and, uh, you know, I think one of the, the interesting things about us, I would say that we and, and Zenefits at the time were the first two, um, companies that achieved sort of a billion dollar valuation uh, uh, selling to other startups. Um, and um, it's never been done before. It had never been done before. You know, it, classical venture before 2015, if you were going to be a billion dollar B2B SaaS business, you sold to the Fortune 1000. That's, that's what you did. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we kind of paved this new category of companies that could reach a billion dollar you know, um, valuation just selling to, to other startups. I actually think it's a little bit of a head fake. Like, I, I think it's a very unique um, uh, circumstance that makes that true. I don't think very many companies can do that. And I, I think there were a lot of companies that followed thinking, oh, I can just sell another tool to startups and reach a billion dollar valuation. And I don't think that actually works. Like, I, I don't think that that happens very often. Uh, Zenefits didn't. And if you look at all the, the the companies, the B2B SaaS companies now, they they had to break out of out of uh, venture. Like nobody, some of them could get a niche and sort of get started in startups, but you very quickly had to, to okay. get out of startups. I mean, like Rippling, you know, it doesn't, you know, like ten yeah. percent of their book is startups, right? They they sell to to mid market, you know, normal companies. Um, we're I think the only we're the only you know large company, billion dollar plus company that exclusively sells to startups. Um, and I think we're in a very unique category um, uh, uh, in that way. And I guess you're also quite uniquely positioned, right? I mean, there's a whole there's a really interesting network effects model to this. I guess back in the early days, right? Once you've got your first 100 founders using you and they trust you and you've got five or six VCs and it works, I guess the network effect starts to come to play. Is that kind of how it played out in the early days? Yeah, that, that's right. This had very, very strong uh, network effect because you sort of, you know, you got companies on which brought investors on uh, who received their electronic stock certificates, you know, on Carta. Um, uh, who then, you know, referred more companies, which brought more investors on and, and that positive feedback loop uh, uh, helped a lot. I would also say we had very strong network effect um, uh, with law firms. Uh, and it's sort of, it's a little bit harder to kind of kind of see and measure, but there is this very strong entrenched, like once you got the law firms to sort of adopt you and and train on you uh, and, and, and bless you as kind of their tool, um, they they move all their portfolio companies on you because they don't want to you know learn other systems they don't want to take the risk of a bad system all of those things and so there's very strong um, partnership uh, uh, network effects as well so we've been really lucky like the um, uh, kind of owning owning the the market sort of being the dominant player in the market via network effect has been powerful for us. How are you tracking the network effects with startups and VCs? I mean referrals was it a unique code we talk about the referrals a lot on on this podcast so I'd love to find out like how are you actually tracking um you know referring customers yeah so we don't um well, I'll give you the hack that kind of unlocked all of this uh, yeah. uh in the in the um early days so the the hack was um a lot of people didn't want cap table software in the early days because you know cap table software was Carta, we mostly do, there, there's sort of two two types of companies. There's like companies that are building something new and companies that are um, building something to replace. And so we were a company that's building something new. Like nobody bought CapTable software before Carta. It just didn't exist in the world. 
Uh, and then there's people that are building stuff like a new database, like it's a better database or a new payroll system. It's a better payroll system. Um, but people are used to buying payroll systems and it, it's two very different go to market motions. You know, when you're trying to sell something new, you're trying to convince somebody to buy something that never existed before that they, they didn't know they needed because by definition, they've never needed it. They've never used it before. Whereas if, if you're trying to sell something that they already have, they know they need it. You're just trying to convince them that what you have is better than what they what they've already got. Um, and we've always been in the first category is trying to convince people they um, need something that they've never needed before. Um, one of the, th the hacks that we had was we had this uh, people didn't want cap table software. They didn't know they needed it, um, but they needed 49A and uh, uh, by statute. And we built a 49A product three months, six months after we launched cap tables, uh, because it's a, it's just a math problem that sits on the cap table. And what we found is we had more product market fit in the early days on, on 49A valuations. And so what we'd say is like, hey, we'd, we'd sell you the 49A valuation for um, you know, 100 bucks, when at the time it was $5,000 if you went you know, to a firm to do it. But you had to buy, you had to be on our cap table software. Like we couldn't, we wouldn't sell you the 49A if you weren't a cap table software company or a cap, cap table software customer. And so people would reluctantly go, fine, I'll buy your cap table software just so I can get the cheap 49A. Um, so that was hack number one. That's how we got the, the bootstrap, the early customers that we couldn't convince that they needed this thing that they never needed before. The second hack was to your point of referral codes was, I would talk to all these investor, investors because I go fundraising, um, you know, about cap tables, and they go, oh, "It's an interesting problem," but you know, the investor feedback for Carta was always, uh, "Market's too small." Like I, I can see how you can make a small ten million dollar business out of this, but the market's too small. And I say, "Okay, I totally understand," but you know, I do this cap table stuff, and I do four nine A's. Um, uh, would you and your um, would you want a discount code for your portfolio companies? that I, I'll give them, you know, 50% or 20% off or, you know, 500 bucks off their first year, you know, for a 49A. Uh, and they say, oh yeah, I'd love that. I said, great. So I would send them and I said, I'll follow up on email. So I, I just send them an email and say, hey, you know, Mary, it was so great to meet you at your office yesterday. Thanks so much for hosting me. Um, as, as we discussed, here's the, the discount code that you asked for, for your portfolio companies. And I would just run it like my finger across the, the, the keyboard. It didn't matter. QSTR4, right? It didn't matter what it was. I just make something up and I say, here's the discount code, give it to your portfolio companies. And, you know, they'll, you know, I'll give them, you know, a uh, free first year 49A. And I'd send it to them. And what they would do is they would forward it to their CEOs at myventurefund.com to their entire Google group of CEOs. And then they, the CEOs would all forward it to me going, hey, my investor recommended you. They didn't even recommend it, but it was just because the investor forwarded this thing and it made it look like we were friends, uh, that they they felt that they recommended it. They forwarded it to me, my investor recommended to you, can I use this discount to get a 49A from you? And I'd say, of course, uh, and I would just sign them up. And wow. that was the the hack that started started it all. Um, uh, and it worked incredibly well. And I just did that over and over until we got uh, to critical mass. That doesn't work anymore because now every startup does that. Every startup tries to get their investor to sell their product to the other portfolio companies. And so it's complete noise, but we were the first ones. And so at the time, all the investors were like, of course, I'd love a discount. Like nobody had ever offered uh, them th that before. We were the first ones to ever do that. That's pretty cool. I mean, like you said, uh, all good things come to an end, right? So how do you think about uh, acquiring customers today, especially founders? Yeah, well, so that's the that's the 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 thing about marketing is um, I think what people don't realize is is marketing is really about arbitrage. Uh, marketing is finding gaps uh, 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 in the market that other people don't see in closing it. Right. And so so by definition, any good marketing hack eventually goes away because other people will track it, just like the first people that did Google ads <laughs> or pay, you know, like that worked great until everybody did it. First people on Facebook that worked great until everybody did it. First people on LinkedIn worked great. And so like, you know, by definition, that's why marketing is so good. Bad marketing is so easy to do because it's just 
what everybody else does. Good marketing is so hard to do because it's exactly what nobody else is doing, right? You have to find a way uh, to innovate. So I would say, you know, these days we're much more in scale uh, mode. So it's a lot of about a third of our um, uh, uh, inbound, or at least in our startup business, a third of our uh, or cap table business. A third of our leads um, uh, come from investors, a third from lawyers, and third uh, direct. Um, mm -hmm. And so we've got teams that cultivate the investor channel. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a BD team, business development team. We have a, a team that cultivates the law firm channel, and all they do is talk to law firms and you know help them work with clients. And then we have a direct sales team, an SDR and marketing demand gen team. Uh, and it's just about optimizing those, those funnels through the process. Yeah. And so you guys changed your name quite, I mean, not quite early on, but quite late, right? I think it was three or four years into the into the business. It started off with eShares, then Carter. We see quite a lot of early stage companies. They think of a name just as a temporary name, then they change the name, right? How hard was that to change the name? And why did you want to or have to? Um, it was great. It was one of the great one of the, I think the best things that we did, uh, but we, we didn't want to at the time. Um, so we were forced to, uh, we, um, we did not have eShares.com. We had eSharesInc.com. eShares.com was owned by a domain squatter in Florida. Uh, and we tried to buy it. And I think he wanted, I think he wanted like a hundred thousand bucks for it. And, you know, and at the time we had only raised like a million eight and that was like way too much. So we said no, you know, and so we kept going and then we raised our series A. Uh, so we went back to him and said, Hey, can we buy it? And then, you know, he knew we raised the series A. So he wanted a million. Right. Uh, I'm like, no, you know, Playing the game. kept going. So we go, we raised our series B. Uh, we go back and then he wants 10. And so we just realized we we're like dealing with a, a, you know, a terrorist and and it was worse. So not only was he just you know trying to extort us, but he started changing eShares eShares.com to make it look kind of like our website. Um, and you could log in, and he he and then people were like going to his website and putting their passwords into his website, trying to log in. And so it was becoming a security issue for us. So he's trying to force our hands to to buy it. And so we we not only had to change the name because we knew we were never going to buy it, we had to change it in a hurry because he was really yeah. trying to, you know, uh, right. tighten the screws. Um, so we we did this whole um, uh, naming exercise. And this sounds really foo-foo, um, but I, I got to say it was actually one of the best things we did. We hired a naming consultant. It sounds ridiculous, but she was very inexpensive. It was like $2,000, but she just basically gave us a list of names. And we went through this whole like marketing exercise with the whole company and the board where we like talked about who we are and, you know, are we voyagers? Are we explorers? Are we leaders? You know, and we sort of did this whole soul searching exercise through finding a name. Um, and then we had a list of names and um, Carta came up and amongst all, you know, employees voted on names, um, a, a leadership team voted on names. Uh, and then board voted on names. And the number one name across all three groups was Carta. And mm. um, and then it just so happened, um, we ended up, uh, the way you buy names is you have to hire a broker because you don't want the person who knows, the person who owns it, you don't want them to know who the buyer is. So you have to find an intermediary um, because if the person knows, they'll charge you more. Um, so we, we found this guy, um, we got recommended through an investor who does this for a living. Um, Carta.com was owned by uh, a grad student, um, or a, like I, I think a, a history student in South America, I think Argentina or something, who had reserved Carta.com for his studies uh, for a dissertation on Ma the Magna Carta, but uh -huh. he hadn't. He never finished it. Like been sitting there for a few years, and our guy goes and offers him $100,000 for Carta.com. And I think, it was, I think it was the greatest day in this young man's life. And uh, it was the greatest, you know, it was like, we're, pay him 100,000 bucks. We got it. Uh, and so we ended up changing our name to Carta and it was great. Yeah. That's such a cool story. That's such a cool story. But um, 
when you were when the e-shares kind of name was kind of going around were you not uh kind of freaking out yeah i mean it was it was very problematic and you know we thought about flying to go see this guy in florida and you know you know tracking him down and you know uh you know trying to negotiate with him and you know you just actually got this you know we did background checks on him you just got the sense that this, this these are shady people these, these domain people um you know he had a criminal record it just this is just somebody you just didn't want to deal with um uh and so we're just like we, we just have to have to change the name and get out of it and and he was furious uh when we um he i did i think he did not see that coming i think he thought we were gonna come to him and and give him 10 million bucks um uh, uh he was furious he sent us a bunch of crazy emails uh afterwards so pretty bad founders will go through the, these kind of you know uh lessons during their journey what do you think you learned from that um you know i think uh you know i think one of the things that um uh you know when you're an early stage founder um uh there's always like this like um uh people are like rooting for you um uh uh people are also against you right that's one of the hard thing about founders like investors say no customers say no you know um employee you know people that you want to work for you say no and and they don't say it nicely right they're like no and you're stupid for asking right no that's a crazy idea no what are you thinking you know like um and that's part of just the resilience of being a founder you know is that um is, is to keep going um um but 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 by and large nobody like resents your success because you don't have any <laughs> right you're like everybody's like like rooting for you i think that was the first time that somebody was trying to go after the success we were having um that was trying to to take uh because we were um doing well um and and unfortunately I, you know, I've seen that many, many more times, like, uh, the more success you have, the more people, um, uh, go after you. Uh, and, and that's just an unfortunate, um, unfortunate thing. Yeah. Well, I guess that helps when you have a great team right behind you. So I'd love to jump to, uh, to, to talent, you know, growing a company is incredibly hard as we know. Um, what were the first five to six hires you made for eShares then which turned to Carter? Yeah. So, so it's all, you know, five to six, it's, it's basically all product engineering. Uh, and then you're one kind of, uh, every, everything person, right. That does office management, payroll, <laughs> you know, employee, you know, benefits, you know, uh, uh, you know, orders, orders, food, uh, et cetera. Uh, so you have the one person that like just takes care of everything and then everything's, you know, product and engineering, the, the key, the key, um, uh, you know, people to have is like, um, can you, can you, you know, have somebody that can really execute on the things that you need done without you, you know, you know, paying attention every second of the day, right? That's what you're really looking for at that, at that stage. Um, you don't have to have people that know what to do, um, at that stage. Uh, uh I, I sort of, um, when I talk about like leadership, um, you know, people ask me like, how do you evaluate your leaders? And I, I say it's on, it's on, it's actually three things, but I'll just talk about the first two, which is, um, do they know what to do? Uh, and can they get their team to do it? And, um, in the, in the early stages, you don't have to have people that sort of like know what to do. Like it's your job to know what to do, but you have to have people who can do it. Like they can, when you're like, Hey, build, here's the Figma, here's what I need built, build it and build it like this and make it work by, by Thursday, right? You have to have people that can execute on that. And you, you, um, over time, as you get, as you get bigger, you need more of the people that can do both, right? That like, you don't have to tell them what to do. Like they know what to do, uh, and, and they can, they can do it. Um, and so that's the, that's the challenge. One of the, the other things I'll say is, um, the biggest mistake I think most founders make is they hire salespeople uh, too soon. Uh, and I, I tell founders, um, 
uh, they really shouldn't be hiring salespeople. And the reason why is because most most founders these days are product founders. You know, they like they like product, and they don't like to do sales. Um, and sales sucks. It's hard, uh, especially early stage sales. And so, so the first thing they do is like, I don't like sales. Like, so I'll hire a salesperson and sales is hard, you know? And so they like, I'll hire. And also like sales never goes well. And so like, if it doesn't go well, I can blame the salesperson. Right. So it's like, it, it solves so many. So, you know, you kill so many birds with that stone if you just hire a salesperson. So they all do. And the problem with that is that, um, the founder is the only person that can bridge the gap between sales and product. Uh, and they need to be in those sales meetings mm -hmm. for, for two reasons. One is when the customer is like, I, I, um, I won't buy your product unless you do X, you know, feature X. You're the only person that can credibly say, I will do feature X if you buy, right? The salesperson can't say that, right? You're the only person that can close that deal. And encounter, you know, on the other side of that, you're actually the only person that can actually make the product team do X, where the salesperson, if they said it, couldn't actually mm -hmm. convey that to the product team. And thirdly, maybe, is you're also the only person that can apologize later if you just didn't do it, right? You're like, I'm going to do X, and then you don't do it, right, for, for whatever reason. You can still get a pass with the customer because you know, you're allowed one pass on those, on those things. And so you just have to be in those, in those sales meetings in those, in those early days to find that product market fit and make sure uh, it, it, it works is that that's the most important thing is to get the product market fit. And the worst thing a founder can do is hire salespeople before uh, they get to product market fit because they won't be in it and, and, and they abdicate uh, themselves from that too soon. And then they never get it. And they spend all their money on sales before they get the product market fit. Totally right. Complete degree. You have to be in those meetings to understand how the customer buying, what are they thinking, and what's not so good about the product. But as the company grows, you no longer have time for that, right? So, okay, hiring salespeople in the early days is probably not the best uh, strategy. When is the right strategy? Is it when you've raised a seed round, when you got your first hundred customers? What was it for you? Yeah. So. Uh, the way that I usually coach founders on this is like the first salesperson you should hire is really like kind of like an SDR. And it's the person that's going to set up the sales meetings for you. Hmm. So usually the founder is like, I just want to hire a salesperson. So I don't have to worry about it. And then no, it's like, get the SDR that gets the meetings for you. So you don't have to like hustle for the meetings. Like, so you still do the meetings, but you, you know, um, uh, and then, you know, once the, the, the point where you can start hiring a salesperson is when you have sort of a repeatable pitch um, that you can consistently deliver um, that's working. And then once that happens, then you can start bringing in a salesperson. You're like, here's the script, like do this script. Uh, uh, and then if, it's, if, if they can do the script, then they can start selling, right? And that's, that's where it starts to, starts to scale. Um, but if you're still like, you know, well, the customer is like, well, can it do this? Can it do that? And you're like, well, it can't do that now, but uh, you know, I'll make it do this, or but it can do this, you know. And and you're still doing that, you know, product market fit, you know, movement. It's too soon. The salespeople can't can't do that. So, but as soon as you start, like, hey, this is repeatable. Like, I've got something here. That's when you start you start bringing in the salespeople. How big is Carter today in terms of uh, employees? About we're about uh, 350 million in in uh, ARR, about 2,000 uh, employees. Amazing. On the other side, as the founder starts to transition, as the company grows, your roles change, right? Quite frequently. How has your role adapted in the last 12 months? And second part of that question: You manage people. How do you know if you're a good manager? Yeah. So. Um, you know, these days, um, I, I, uh, I work on really two, I would say three things. It's like, I've set up the exec team so I can work on three things, which I think are my both conveniently are both my strong suits, uh, and probably the, the, um, most important things that I can work on. Um, and so, um, uh, so one is, uh, strategy. So I spend a lot of time with the strategy team. Uh, I have a, a strategy team. Uh, and, you know, we think through things like new products, we think through things like, 
you know, what do we do about international um, or what do we, you know, how do we change the org design or how come, you know, certain product line is not selling well, you know, things like that. So thinking through kind of deeper problems. The second thing I work on is product. Uh, so I, I still kind of keep my product roots and spend a lot of time with product. And the third is um, what I'll call like deep dives. So whenever something in the org is like broken, that's like when I, I go in and, and try to fix it, you know, and then sort of the rest of the exec team, their job is to do like the the day to day operations, like running the trains, like keeping the system working, right? I I set the strategy and I'm like, here, do all of this, right? Here here's the map, here's where you should go, right? Um, uh, I'll work on the product that we're building and I'll, I'll 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 fix the things that are broken, but they're responsible for getting us from point A to point B, and that's that's their their job, and that's kind of the division. Uh, of labor. So that's how I, I, I try to spend my, um, uh, my time. Um, you know, and I think, you know, in terms of the, 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 uh, the good manager, uh, stuff, um, I think it's, it's really a, a question of, um, you know, the, the easiest way to tell is, you know, do people want to do things for you? Um, uh, and if they want to get shit done for you, you're probably doing something right. You know, you're you're giving them stuff that they believe is worth doing, and you're inspiring them to do it, uh, and they feel empowered and enabled uh, and capable of doing it. And if you feel like, boy, these people do not want to work <laughs> and do what I want them to do, uh, something's not not going so well. Yeah, completely agree. Um, well, hey, we've got some questions here um, around founders um, who are trying to become better managers and they're trying to hire really good talent. Um, how do you think about issuing stock options to early stage employees if you're a startup? And yeah, how, how would you go around doing that? Yeah. So, um, well, I, I don't want to turn this into a sales pitch, but uh, there's we have a product for this, actually. It's called uh, Carta Total Compensation. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a benchmarking tool. So if, if you've heard of companies like Radford that do like salary benchmarking, it's our kind of real time software version of Radford. So it'll give you salary and equity for, for different, you know, roles. So you're like, you know, VP of engineering for a series, a startup, how much should I pay them? You know, and it'll kind of, and, you know, in, in San Francisco, and it'll kind of tell you like, you know, half a percent of the company, you know. Three hundred thousand dollars in salary, or whatever it is. So, so just in getting the the numbers right, like there's there's tools uh, uh, for that. Um, uh, I think the 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 um, probably the harder question is like, how do I construct the team? You know, mm -hmm. what's the kind of like the the team construction of skill sets that I put around me, right? Like, um, when do I bring in a head of product? When do I bring in a head of finance? You know, what seniority of you know uh, uh do i have of these people you know who who reports to me who doesn't right how do i decide those things i think those are really um uh those those are probably the more fundamental questions like the the how much do i pay them is you know get the data and it's a math exercise but the like the the roles uh, uh and the, the the structure of the team and how you manage that team that that's really the art uh, i think of being a ceo if you want to create a really good culture and you're sort of the pre-seed kind of seed stage, maybe series A, how much equity of the company should you, or, you know, would you recommend setting aside um, for employees? Yeah. So I think um, I, I would like this decouple sort of, sort of equity and culture. And I, I wouldn't have been like, maybe say like set aside. I, I think, you know, general rule of thumb is, you know, between rounds, kind of like 10%, give or take, you know, you see everything from eight to 12% uh, um, equity pools, you know, between rounds. So if you're, you know, a seed round, you know, call it 10% and, you know, maybe you use, you'll, you'll use the whole thing before the next round. Maybe you won't, and maybe mm -hmm. use, you'll, you know, you'll use too much and you have to top it off a little. It's not, it's not the end of the world. Um, I think the most important thing in getting comp right uh, is, um, uh, fairness, uh, because as much as you, you know, fairness and consistency, because as much as you think like it's confidential, it isn't, they all, they all know, uh, you know, I, I've actually run this experiment. So, and, you know, we were a series, 
seed or a i think uh and i you know i'm like you know transparency is a core value of mine i'm like super transparent you know and everything and so i decide uh, one of the you know we were our first cap table customer uh and i said um all the employees i was like they should be able to see the cap table um and so you know because at the time most companies hid their cap table i'm like i'm not going to do that all employees can see the card of cap table and so i did which which basically meant they could see their own equity against other employees equity it's basically like i opened up payroll hmm. and i got i got so many people so upset you know we were only like 15 employees or something at the time and they were coming into my office complaining about each other because you know so and so had four more shares than they did and you know you know bob's an idiot and he got four shares more than i did and you know the and the thing is it's like the early employees they were all friends right the early employees like all friends with each other right they recruit their friends like I had two guys that like were so mad at each other because one had more four more shares than the other and they were cousins they grew up together and they were like he's an idiot Henry he, he shouldn't doesn't he doesn't deserve that and like they just turned on each other um and so like the the most important thing I think you can get right and and comp is like a, a structure a consistent and fair structure that you can use to apply to employees so that when they do challenge you you can say hey this isn't this isn't me just going, I like Bob better than you. This is like this is the framework I used and it's consistent. And you're never gonna please everyone, right? I mean, how did you uh solve uh, the internal politics, if we call it that? Yeah. So I, I did a lot of work on comp. So I would I would I actually do these decks each year where I'd be like, here's how I do comp. Uh, and I would give them the framework. And you know, obviously I wouldn't be like, um, uh, you know, individual names what their comp is, but I'd give them the framework for how, you know, what your role is, what, who, who you are, you know, how long you've been here. Da, 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 da. And I would tell them, this is, this is how you did it. And here's the graph of everything. And, you know, uh, and so you may not like your comp and almost guaranteed you won't because nobody thinks they get paid enough, right? Like, that's like a given, just like everybody thinks they're a better driver than an average, than average. Everybody thinks they're underpaid. So I'm not going to try to convince you that you're uh, uh, not underpaid. I know you all think you're underpaid, but at least you're all underpaid the same. Uh, and this is the, this is the way I do it. Uh, and that, that did a pretty good job of everyone going, mm. okay, well, at least yeah. he's got a system, right? I can't argue the system. Yeah. I love that transparency. Um, I think it's important and especially as you grow right um you're never gonna be able to please everyone people want different things and you just can't you just have to manage people's expectations right and right in, in the best possible way um but hey let's jump to fundraising you guys have raised just over a billion dollars uh in the last 11 years which is pretty incredible um how are you thinking about the fundraising environment today for early stage startups and the reason why i ask you guys are quite lucky because you have a lot of data available and you probably know what's going on, what's happening. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's it's definitely dropped off. I what I often tell, um, you know, if you look at kind of the graphs, like you know, it, it looks like it's fallen off a cliff. I would say, you know, it's way worse in growth. Uh, early stage is is much much healthier than like growth stage, late stage. Um, but but it certainly it certainly dropped off. Um, but it, it feels horrible in part because of the the sort of manic uh, period of kind of 2021, 20, 22, um, that just like soared. But if you actually took out that, you know, 20 COVID period um, and you looked at, you know, funding rates now, it's it's about where, you know, we were in 2019, 18, 19, um, which in 2018, 19, we're like, this is incredible. I'm sure you remember, yeah. Holly. Like we're like, this is like the best fundraising environment in the world, best time ever in the world to be an entrepreneur. And it, it's because we've had this like outlier COVID period that now it just feels terrible. Um, so it's not as dire and bad as I think you know it may feel and people think. It's just because we've we've got such a high water you know benchmark that we never we may never get to. But if you benchmark to 2018, 19. We're we're back to back to those to those levels. Mm. 
and um on the uh, on, I, I agree by the way and um on the Carter fundraising uh you know you've probably learned a lot along the way um there are two questions here let's start with the first one what's your what's been the biggest lesson in fundraising for you personally you know, I think there's like three, maybe three things. I mean, there's probably tactical stuff I can walk through, like how do you just run a process, but maybe, you know, for the early stage um, founders and then the ones that are moving later stage, um, there's sort of these like transitions uh, where in the in the early stage that the, the story, um, uh, especially in like, you know, early stage seed, your first, you know, pre-seed, your first round, I think one of the mistakes a lot of founders make is they think it's it's about like how good a story I tell and my charisma, you know. And I I feel bad for these founders because when you know most invest ninety ninety eight percent of the investors will say no, and so every time they get a no, they're like, oh, you know, I just did a bad job pitching. Like I'm not a good, you know, pitcher. And so much of the early, you know, the angel investor early stage, you know, seed stage match. Um, is not about like, is a good pitch. It's about, does the investor relate to and care about the problem or not? And the, I could tell when I was raising for each years, I, I could tell in the first three minutes if they were going to invest or not. Like it just didn't, I didn't have a need to like, do, like it was so stupid to do the next 30 minutes of the meeting because you could just tell either they were like, I like, you know, I'm interested in cap tables and I find this problem interesting or they didn't like there's nothing I was going to say that was going to convince them, you know, either way. It just it was the, once they were interested, then, oh. yes, then it matters. Right. I have to be compelling. I have to have an answer. I have to have a solution, a vision, like all that stuff. But if they just didn't care about cap tables, I was wasting my my time trying to convince them to care about cap tables. And I think one of the the tough things for founders is they they get really hard on themselves because they think they're not good pitchers. Where most of this very early investing is not about pitching, but it's about matching. It's about finding the investors that care about your problem. Um, mm. So I think that's one is is fine. You know, this is a sorting problem, not a not a pitching problem. Um, I think when you get, you know, past that kind of like finding, you know, when you've found the people that care about your problem, um, then I do think it becomes now a pitch exercise. Like, can you tell a convincing story? And um, the storyline really has to be like, hey, here's my wedge. Um, and and here's why this wedge, you know, has a chance at, at working. But if and if I win this wedge, uh, I can take it from A to something big, right? And every every pitch is that. It's like, here's my wedge, and then I can go A to something big. And I think a lot of founders like kind of lose sight of that. They get, you know, caught up in the complexity and the, you know, being smart and like, you know, just they just kind of lose like, and you got to keep it simple. It, it's really all startups are very, it's it's all the same playbook. You get a wedge in an opening and then you have to paint a path to something big and that's it. Um, and then I, I think, you know, the, maybe the third transition is um, when you get into the the later stage, you know, kind of series B, series C, where it's no longer about like, you know, con, you know, personality and charisma and a good story and the numbers start to matter. I think that's, that's maybe the third rude awakening for founders. You know, I remember, you know, my series C uh, pitch, you know, for our, 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 our round and I had my, my CFO, my brand new CFO helping me and, you know, investors started asking, you know, I was like, you know, full charisma telling the great Carta story of how we're going to, you know, change the world forever. And they're like, well, what's your gross margin? And they started just t asking me questions with words I've never heard of, like variable cost and fixed cost and, you know, net dollar retention and like all these things actually start to matter now. And it's a whole different category. And like our last round, our last, five, you know, $500 million round, I mean, is a private equity led is they don't care, you know, how, how, how smooth talking I am or, you know, how charismatic I am. It's all numbers. You know, uh, I sit there with Charlie and they don't care what anything I have to say. They're all talking to my CFO the whole time. Uh, so it's just, it's another transition. Um, Super interesting. And I think also founders need to keep their pitch deck very concise, right? Not 20, 30 pages, 10 slides, um, product team and so on, right? Just get straight to the point. Otherwise, 
have to remember these investors are looking through 50, 60 decks a day, not just yours, right? Um, but we'd love to also just find out your fundraising journey. So pre-seed, what was the pre what was the kind of the fundraising journey? Pre-seed was how much up to your latest round? So we did a seed round um uh for 1.8 um a series a for seven series b for 17 uh uh a series c for 30 a series d for 40 maybe no 50 um a series e for i think uh, 200 uh and f for 250 i think and then a g for 500 oh. something like that yeah Pretty amazing i mean in 11 years right uh, yeah what are you thinking about next are you thinking different markets what's what's kind of the the future for vacata yeah so uh, out of sort of 350 million in bookings or arr right now about 60% is our our cap table business um uh 30% is our fund admin business and that's that's actually you know growing really fast now and then 10% is our our kind of newer uh, business which is private equity uh, so we built a cap table product specifically for private equity which has more complex capital structures the portfolio companies are more complex uh requires a different cap table uh product than than venture and so we have this kind of thesis that we can do this kind of one two punch in these different asset classes so in venture it's it's you know establish a relationship punch one is establish a relationship with the portfolio company via the cap table software punch two is then use that relationship with the company to sell fund administration to the venture fund so now we'll go to private equity Punch one, establish relationships with portfolio companies via cap table software. Punch two, you know, self fund administration software to the private equity firm. And we think, you know, at, we think, you know, um, cap tables plus venture fund administration combined is probably a seven hundred fifty million, you know, ARR TAM for us. Um, we think private equity could be two billion, you know, two two to three maybe. So it's you know, it's four or five times bigger than 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 venture for us. And then we can take that playbook and go to oil and gas, you know, and real estate and, you know, hard assets and, you know, um, uh, industrial. So like this, this playbook of, of you know, selling software into the asset itself and then selling, you know, uh, administration into the investors of that asset. That's the playbook we want to repeat, repeat into these different larger asset classes. You kind of uh, answered my next question. I was thinking the other day, property or uh, real estate, right? Fractional ownership is so big, but it's still so tedious, right? Maybe Carter's going to enter that space in the future. Yeah, any anything, you know, we love these like fractional ownership problems that are tracked in spreadsheets and PDFs. Like if, if that's what's happening in the world, like that's that's our sweet spot. That's, that's what we do for a living. Yeah, I've been for it. You guys need to go and uh, disrupt it. But... Hey, before we finish, one thing I um, read about you is you write a letter to your customers every year. Why? Yeah, it's my way to, um, you know, a lot of CEOs will kind of write an end of year letter. I write the the beginning of year letter and it's it's really to kind of tell them what to expect that's that's coming. I think it's a great way to kind of connect with customers. I get a lot of replies, you know, questions, you know, things like that. Um, but it's also a way for me to like um, uh, give them a preview of what what's going to happen this year, you know, new products that are happening, kind of our goals, and ambitions. Um, uh, so it's it's yeah, it's my annual letter. I've been doing it since 2014, and um, it's it's been a great way for me to 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 directly uh, talk to talk to customers. Awesome. Well, hey Henry, such an uh, incredible story. We can't wait to see where Carter goes next. Thanks so much for your time. Massive inspiration, and uh, let's see where Carter goes next. Super. Thank you, Ali. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, all.